Right, I can see those participant numbers going up. We're going to give it a couple minutes to let everybody join in. So meanwhile, you can just stare at our glowing faces. <laughs> Admire Michael Barbaro's plant. <laughs> <laughs> Does the plant have a name? No, just a very big, successful house plant. Good. Okay. Sarah, those are those are those are books, CDs, and records. Yes. Wow! Wow! The snapshots we get into people's homes. This I, is I, the radio I bought on Craigslist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made a point of adjusting the camera so you wouldn't see all the books and CDs on the floor. <laughs> okay. All right. Looks like the participant numbers are still going up. Uh, so we'll give it just another minute or so. So glad that so many people wanted to join. This is really exciting. All right. So it is 4.01 and because we only have 45 minutes, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Uh, welcome everyone on behalf of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. I'm Kimberly Adams, a host and correspondent at the Public Radio Program Marketplace. Thank you all, especially our guests, for taking time to join us today for the art and craft of the interview, How to Deeply Listen. And thank you, Terry Gross and Michael Barbaro for kindly joining us today. We're looking forward to a really great conversation among our guests uh, for the first half of the program, and we're going to open it up to questions. We might be able to get the questions in a little bit earlier. Um, so please share your questions in the Q&A queue. Yes, the question will be record. This session will be recorded as we got a question already. So please put those in. We're going to get to as many of them as we can. Those that we can't get to, we'll maybe try to get to uh, after the program ends. So it's my pleasure. I'm going to read brief intro introductions and then we'll jump in. Terry, as probably everyone knows, is the host and co-executive producer of Fresh Air, the acclaimed radio interview program produced by WHYY FM in Philadelphia and distributed nationally by NPR. Fresh Air with Terry Gross has won numerous awards, including a National Humanities Medal from President Obama, the Peabody Award, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting's Edward R. Morrow Award for outstanding contributions to public radio and for advancing the growth, quality, and positive image of radio. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you. And Michael is the host of The Daily, the New York Times morning news podcast. The Daily debuted in February 2017 as a five-day-a-week program and quickly became the Times flagship podcast. Within nine months of its launch, The Daily was downloaded more than 100 million times. It's now number one in PodTrack's ranking of top podcasts in the U.S. This year, it won a Special Achievement Webby Award from the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences. Welcome, Michael. So good to be here and such an honor to be in the presence of Terry Gross. I am in your right. presence and I listen to the daily all the time. So it's really great to almost meet you. <laughs> well, this counts as real life meeting in yes, our, these this times, life, I think. You know? Yeah. Um, but let's jump right in. What role for each of you does listening play in how you interview? Terry, do you want to go first? Sure. I've learned that if you don't listen, you're going to miss the important thing. And the the problem is when somebody is giving a long-winded, boring answer, that's when you're gonna be distracted because you're always thinking simultaneously, what's my next question as you're trying to listen and thinking is very distracting from listening. Um, and the, the example I like to give is when I was interviewing Grover Norquist of Americans for Tax Reform, was totally anti-tax. We were talking about the real estate tax, which he calls the death tax. He said, um, you know, the death tax, it's kind of like the Holocaust, blah, 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 blah. And I was distracted because I was thinking this interview isn't going well, it's boring. And I realized, oh, I think he said that the death tax was like the Holocaust. Did he really say it? And I didn't know. So I had to say, I think he said that it was like the Holocaust. And so you have to really listen, otherwise you're going to miss something really important or really awful <laughs> that, that the guest has said. Um, I, I, I could say more about listening, but let me let Michael go. What you said about distraction is really important. Um, we have a fair number of distractions in our built into our format, which I think may be different from you, from, from you, Terry. You have a kind of a legendary solitude in your process. 
Um, we, correct me if I'm wrong, we have a Google document that is the basis for our show and producers are in the Google document. And so occasionally something will just kind of screech across the screen and that can be very distracting. And Terry's right, the worst moments in an interview and the worst interviews are when you lose the thread of what the person you're talking to has said because you quite literally can't respond in a way that's meaningful. And the times that has happened have been painful or embarrassing to me because when you listen the next day, it, you can say to yourself, oh man, I just, I, how did I not ask this follow-up question? So you never want to do that. So that the whole art of it is, is figuring out how to not get distracted uh, and, to, and to listen on multiple levels, right? You're listening for yourself as the host, but you're also listening for the listener. And I have developed some quirks that actually pre-existed my time as a audio host because I was a print reporter for a long time. And when I was on the phone with anybody, I would do what you do when you want your listener, your interlocutor, the person on the other side of, of the phone call to feel listened to, which is, mm -hmm, right. You know, and, and we've made the decision on the daily to, to keep a lot of those in. And if you remember from your linguistics classes, you know, those are called back channel responses. They are not the primary channel of the conversation, but they are, they are your responses. They're kind of a, a back channel of it. And and that is both for the, the other person you're talking to, to know you're listening, but it's also a signal to the, uh, to the listeners of, of when something important has happened um, and how you're processing it because ultimately a, a great interview is a proxy for the listener. So there are so many kind of levels of listening that are going on at, at any given moment, but the enemy is distraction. Yeah. And you have to also know what are you listening for? It's like Michael was saying, you listen on several levels, but like, like, like an audio, I'm not going to be editing the interview, but I'm acting as if I am when I'm doing the interview. I'm acting as if like, that was a boring answer. That's going to be edited out. I'm pretty sure of it. So the information that that was in, that was in that question, I have to, that was in that answer. I have to incorporate that into my next question or act as if it was just like never said at all. <laughs> so if I want that information in the interview, I have to find a way to work it into the next question. And I'm also listening for like, um, is this interesting is it, or is it boring? What, should I ask a follow up or should I abandon the subject altogether? Should I keep to the outline that I had made for myself or just ignore it and just follow the guest? For how long should I follow the guest? So like Michael was saying, like, I feel like I'm, I have to listen on like so many different levels at the same time, which adds to the distraction too, because your mind is constantly calculating what's working and what's not, and what to do next and what to say next. Right. And, and, and sometimes it's beautiful and you're in the zone and it's, everything's flowing and you've tossed the script aside and, you're having a real conversation. Other times, not so much. <laughs> like, like Terry said, you know, the conversation can feel like it's not going well, which can be distracting, which can be hard. And you can be thinking to yourself, help. Uh, and, that's, and that makes the conversation hard. Michael, do you ever do stage directions to your interviewees? Like sometimes I'll say like, those answers are too long. We won't be able to fit it into our format. Mm -hmm. And it's also sometimes my way of saying those answers are confusing. Maybe if you made them short, shorter, we'd more easily hear what the point is. Mm -hmm. And I try to do it as, as nicely and as gently and as, um, uh, uh, as calming as possible, you know, not in an insulting way, but I do sometimes step in and say that it needs to be shorter or, you know, forgive me, my answer was, must have been you know, confusing. So let mm -hmm. me restate it, hoping that they'll restate it too. Do you, do you end up doing that on, on the daily? It depends on the guest because it, with you, Terry, almost all of your guests are, they're writers, they're actors, they're, they're, they're kind of journalists, but they're, they're not your colleagues from public radio. When, 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 the, when we at the daily, when we interview a colleague, we may do, we may do a significant amount of that back and forth with a guest, you know, tell me a story. I wonder if you can think about making sure you're telling this chronologically. But the mo moment we bring in a person from the world who happens to intersect with the news, a 12 year old girl whose grandfather died from the coronavirus or Senator Chuck Schumer, then we do not. You know, we sort of have these interesting internal systems and rules around, you know, how we're going to interview different people. And 
uh, stage directions, which is a great word for it, um, they can be very powerful. For example, when we're, talk when we're talking to a colleague, when, you know, when we started the show, we were trying to figure out what the show needed to sound like. And some of our colleagues would come on the show and tell stories the way journalists do with the inverted pyramid. The big news on top and the supporting information and they just kind of get it all out at once. And um, we would joke that sometimes people would come on the show and vomit out the whole story in, in 25 <laughs> seconds. And we'd say, you know, we have 25 minutes to fill here and we'd like to tell this with some drama and some suspense uh, and chronology. So so let's tr let's try it a little more slowly. Let's try it. So yes, absolutely in those formats, we do. You both have been mentioning things about sort of pre-production. This is really great in radio that often these interviews are pre-recorded and so you can sort of leave things on the cutting room floor, you can retake things. But to make this a little bit broader about listening in an interview, when you don't have the benefit of that and you're going live or you're just out in the street doing an interview, how do you take those listening skills and apply them in those circumstances? Well, oh, most of my interviews are long distance interviews. So the advantage of that is you, you like me and the guests, we both have to listen really intently because there's no body language. Um, and since we're on radio, where the listeners don't have any body language, that's not a terrible thing because we're all on equal footing. But you really do have to listen carefully because there are no other cues. Mm. Um, but the advantage too of that is I can take notes, I can look at notes, I can page through a book to get a quote that I want without feeling that I'm losing eye contact. Because when I'm interviewing somebody who's across the table from me, I feel like I have to lock in eye contact, otherwise they'll think I'm not paying attention. And since I have a very faulty memory, I really like having notes in front of me um, and being able to actually look at them too. <laughs> In-person interviews are, are... Uh, somewhat terrifying at times, but I find them very liberating because there is no distraction other than the guest, the, the person you're talking to. So there's there's nothing else in the room but two people talking. And I, I do like the body language a lot. And I like the spontaneity of that. And it does feel more spontaneous to me sometimes to be in, in, per, in the room with someone because you know, all the kind of psychological tools of a person's facial expression and, and your, you know, internalizing it start to happen. And I'll just give you an example. And this was a tough interview. We spoke with Senator Bernie Sanders before anyone was going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party several months ago for a long biographical interview about his time as mayor of Burlington. And there was a very tense moment in the interview where he got very upset. We ended up leaving it in the, uh, in the episode. He got pretty upset at a line of questioning about um, some trips he had taken to Latin America. And it was, it, was, it was actually meant to understand how he approached global issues as mayor, but I think it immediately triggered in him a sense that, oh, you're gonna go to a place that I think journalists like to go that I don't like to go. And he almost got up and left the room and I mean, he started to stand up and it was, it was one of those moments where your whole body, you know, you leave your body and you go up and you look down, and you, oh God. And um, in, in trying to coax him to stay and to keep the conversation moving, um, we achieved something we could have almost never got, have gotten in a, in, a, um, in a long distance interview. And frankly, I think he might've just left the room because all the normal kind of human, um, sympathies might not have been present like wait wait uh, uh, maybe I you know there's none of that just hang up the phone so 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 there's a benefit sometimes but the pandemic has obviously made that virtually impossible everybody who's ever walked out on me has been a uh, long distance no one's ever done it in person and that, how many times has that happened not that many but it's happened we're getting a ton of questions from folks in the audience, so I'd just like to dive right in. Um, the first one we have is from Christopher Gunty. How much time do you spend preparing for an interview? For example, reading the author's book, doing research on the interviewee or the topic they are talking about? I guess I should include you and your the staff that you're working with. Right, well, um, I, I talk about reading the book with um, 
scare quotes around it because it's not read it, reading like I would do if I was on vacation or had a lot of time. You know, I have my own form of plowing through a book kind of quickly, circling everything I want to remember, dog-earing each of those pages and taking notes on everything I've dog-eared and then using those notes as my memory bank from which to uh, inspire my questions. Um, so, you know, I'll do that with the book. I'll also have articles by or about the writer. And there's a different process for movies or for music. But um, I spend a few hours, I'd say. It's a daily show, so it's, I can't really spend more than that. Michael, how do you prepare for, for the interviews that are so well-structured? You know, like, like you have a whole narrative, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that always works so well. We, we, we take, we take uh, what we call scripting, preparing for an interview, really, really seriously and can and invest the up to days into it. And it depends on the kind of episode we do. You know, we do one day turnaround episodes that might be about a Supreme Court decision. And we approach that in one very particular way, which might be two hours of thinking through a structure and writing down a kind of ideal set of questions um, before we go into an interview. We did an interview about a week and a half ago that represents the most ambitious kind of interviews we do. It was with a, union, a police union leader named Vince Champion. We prepared for that interview for days, days and days. Um, so I'd say maybe, you know, seven or eight hours in total of time where we researched, brought our research to each other, brainstormed, started writing questions, sent those questions to other people on the team. What do you think? Okay, came back um, and then did a final uh, batch of, of, you know, brainstorms around it. And, you know, we uh, we recognize that with a daily show that wants to that is highly produced and feels sounds highly produced that you know that the one thing you can't go back and fix at the end is is questions you didn't ask. Um, you can always put some music into a show. You can always um, edit certain things. But if you didn't ask the right question and you didn't think about the questions enough beforehand, um, then it won't work. And I I. I think whenever people speak about interviewing, there's a suspicion that that hosts have this kind of like higher order of skill uh, than than anybody else when it comes to uh, asking spontaneous questions. That might be true of some people. I'm going to guess it's true of Terry. I know that when it comes to the daily, it's all about the preparation. It's all about just how much labor and thinking goes into what the question needs to be, what a possible answer might might look like where we want the conversation to go. We think a lot about and talk a lot about kind of the arc of a conversation. Where does it start? Where is it going? Where may it end? And of course, sometimes you have to toss that all away. It's just it, the conversation just goes someplace else. But I think the, the show reflects just how much rigor we put into that process. I just want to add one thing on my end, which is that I don't gather the research for, for myself. The producers do that. And it's so helpful to have everything collected and then it's on me to read it, but um, I couldn't possibly do all that by myself. And the producers like read through it and pick out some key points and organize it in a way so that I can read it in a kind of a, a sensible order. <laughs> so um, yeah, I didn't want to leave that out. Well, since you two both just brought up your teams and your collaborators, obviously we are in the middle of this moment talking about diversity in newsrooms. How do you think the makeup and the diversity on your own teams influences the guests you select and, you know, the types of questions that you ask and how you listen? Well, we're working on um, uh, increasing the diversity on our staff right now, both on air and, and off. Um, um, so that's a kind of work in progress for us, but, you know, we do have like two people of color on our team and people of different generations on our team. So it's, um, it's good. It's like, um, that's really helpful because, you know, as you know, everybody brings their own point of view to it. Everybody's reading different things and, uh, there's things we share in what we're reading and looking at, but there's things that we don't, and it's really important to have to have all that input. 
Yeah, we it's actually something we spent a lot of time this week actually talking about as a as a team at the Daily and the New York Times uh, audio department. It's as an it's a very unfinished piece of work uh, at the New York Times and uh, in audio and at the Daily. Uh, but we do have a a diverse staff. We have a young staff, and we have a majority, vast majority, woman staff. Um, on our team, and all those things profoundly affect the way that we tell stories. And, you know, you can tell from my parents, I'm a white male. Um, I bring to conversations um, some of the experiences and assumptions at times of that very fact. And so the most important thing we do when we set out to do an interview is we bring in as many people as possible to the conversation. And that's who the guest should be, how the structure of the interview ought to go, the kind of challenges we should pose to that guest. And, and of course, sometimes whether we should even have a guest on, you know, which is in some ways the biggest decision you have to make in an interview show. Um, is this person worthy of a platform? And if they are, do we need to challenge them? Or are we here just to rep, just to give them a chance to have a conversation? And and that's a decision arrived at through a lot of conversations. We have another lots and lots of questions here, which gets to sort of the follow-up and the pushback. Uh, litigators, litigators on cross-examination must listen to form effective follow-up. Do you prepare a list of answers that you are looking for? And I imagine it's also answers you might expect uh, and how you will respond to them. I did, so I just, I'm just going to say, I did the thing you're not supposed to do, which is I thought maybe the question was in the chat, so I started looking for it, and I missed keywords. <laughs> Here, you, it's you okay. Know, Here we go again. It all. Please go ahead. <laughs> Litigators on cross-examination must listen to form effective follow-up. Do you prepare a list of answers that you're looking for? And mm. I'm guessing they also mean answers that you expect so that you can plan a pushback. It's a trade secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the forum to give it all up. Come on. Do you want? To, we um, so hard to admit. We do sometimes anticipate an answer, and then of course you're wrong, and so then you can start to to imagine follow up. Just to go back to this interview we did with with the police union leader in Atlanta, where we talked about the Rayshard Brooks shooting. We anticipated that he would bring a set of data with him about um, police interactions with people of color. And we've assumed that his data might look sound a certain way. And we wanted to come prepared with, with what we believed was really important data that we had gathered so that when and if it was required in a follow-up, we could say, I could say, you know, I hear, I hear you saying that, but I want to talk about what I have seen in the data. So yeah, you, you have to, if, because if, if you haven't prepared for that kind of uh, exchange, it's, 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 it can be very problematic. The listener will think to, to him or herself, well, you're just gonna let that, you're just gonna let that person say that and you're not gonna push back or you're pushing back, but you're flailing because you haven't done your research. Yeah, and, and, and for me, you know, I've done research about the per person. My interview is going to be a combination of, of stuff that I already know because I've been spending hours reading about this person, but the listeners might not know. It's going to be a combination of that and things that I'm learning from the interview that I want to follow up on. Um, and then sometimes I'll have like an alternate strategy, you know, like I was just interviewing Michaela Cole, who does the HBO show, I May Destroy You, which is all about uh, sexual assault and it's based in, you know it's a it's a fiction series but, but it's based on her own experience with sexual assault and i had no idea how responsive she would be to asking personal questions about how her own experience informed the show so i had i was working kind of in two levels like if she wants to talk about it i can ask this if it makes her uncomfortable to talk about her own experiences i could go here instead and when I'm interviewing a political person, which I rarely do nowadays, because I don't feel equipped to handle all the facts, I don't, I don't cover a beat politically. I'm not deep enough into 
uh, the facts of their career, of how they voted, of where they stand, and of the lies that they might tell, and the spin they might give, to call them out on it. And I won't have enough time to prepare to call them out on it. So I try to stay away from those interviews, but on the rare times when I do, like Michael said, I try to have like, they'll probably spin it this way and I'll have to come back with them, back at them with that. What Terry just said is really important though. It's, it's vital to know who you're not prepared to interview because sometimes yeah. offers come through and it sounds really exciting. Um, if you're not prepared to interview somebody uh, in the public sphere, especially a, a public person who is polarizing, I would lean, you know, personally, I would say, and we've had these conversations um, on the daily with, with producers and editors, we're not ready for that interview. We're not, we're just not ready for that interview. Uh, we have to push it back. Or we may never be ready for that interview. You know, one of our, one of our colleagues recently um, interviewed um, Bill, Bill Barr, the attorney general, and it was, a, it was a very intense and complicated interview. And I read the transcript and I actually uh, wrote him a note because I, I, I really, I, I was very um, interested in how he had done it. Uh, and those are hard, that's a really hard interview, um, which doesn't mean you shy from it, but that's a very particular kind of difficult interview. And so Terry, it's, it's very heartening to hear you say that there are, there, you know, that you're aware of the kinds of interviews that you, you may not feel equipped to do. Both of you in your interviewing styles really seem to be able to draw people out and, and make people feel comfortable talking to you, whether they're bigger names or regular folks. And this kind of relates to a question from Ali McGee, which is in the chat, so you can read it, Michael. <laughs> it says, I always struggle just because my, of my personality to battle the urge just to make the interviewee really comfortable, sometimes to the detriment of the interview, because I will tend to gloss over the details that actually deserve zeroing in on or critique. On the one hand, I think it genuinely makes people comfortable talking to me. On the other, I'd love some tips on how to push folks and how to even recognize when I need to do that in the moment, especially when the interview is live and I'm thinking about and feeling many things. Hmm. Um, well, there's interviews where you want them to feel comfortable and interviews where it doesn't matter. Like in a political interview, I, I, like when I was making Hillary Clinton really uncomfortable in an interview I did with her asking about... Um, uh, gay marriage and you know same-sex marriage and how she changed her mind on that and she kept really pushing me back. I didn't worry about making her uncomfortable because that's what you do with politicians. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, if you're asking tough questions, they're going to be uncomfortable and they're going to try to dodge it. But if I'm interviewing Michaela Cole about her sexual assault, I want her to feel comfortable. I don't want her to feel like I'm transgressing and on really personal sensitive material that nobody should have to talk about unless they want to. Um, so, you know, usually with guests, and this is a liberty I have because it's recorded and edited. Before the interview starts, I'll say, let me know if I ask you anything too personal and I'll, I'll move on to something else, you know, because I don't want to, I don't want to push you beyond what you're comfortable saying. In a personal interview, like with writers and artists, performers, I feel very comfortable doing that. And it gives me the liberty to ask anything because they've been reassured that they have the right to push back and I'll, I'll respect that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always go well. Sometimes there's still like friction, but, but it usually helps uh, put everybody at, at, at ease. Michael, how do you draw people out in an interview and deal with that? balance of making people comfortable comfortable versus pushing back? I think a lot of it is, a, is about that first question in a way, you know, with the tone that's being set from the beginning of a conversation. And one of the things that happens on the daily, and we often use it, it's, a, it's not a brand new idea, but we, we certainly like to do it, is to include in the episode some of the informal ways that we interact with people at the beginning of conversations or at the end, whether that's a colleague or us walking into the room and introducing me introducing myself to a senator or somebody in public life or uh, uh, somebody who's intersecting with the news we're, ending with, we're interviewing. And when I think about making someone comfortable at, and, and that first question, I think about an interview we did with a man who owned a gun store and who sold a weapon that was used in a mass shooting. He sold the gun used in the Virginia Tech shooting. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could have a conversation with him that 
would be a, that would be illuminating, that would hold him accountable, but that wouldn't make him feel like it was crossfire, that we were there to, and you know, when, when people have intersected in, when their people's lives have intersected with the news, it can often be pretty, pretty bad. Like it was not a pleasant experience for them. And the media may represent for them something that just showed up with a camera and was pretty invasive and asked, started asking tough questions. And so we chose to start that question with just an exceptionally straightforward inquiry, which was, tell me about your store. Tell me about the store. And we did that because we wanted to give him a chance to talk about how he got into the gun selling industry. And I think it's maybe a somewhat underutilized, but very simple tactic of tell me, t tell me who you are. Tell me how I, tell me how you got to the place where you somehow became a person intersecting with the news and, and that person will open up and, and he ended up feeling like he could talk to us. And it was not until midway into the interview that we asked a question that we had prepared very carefully, which was tell me about the date, tell me about the day of TK, TK, TK. And it was the day that, of the mass shooting at, um, at Virginia Tech. By which point we had we had started to have a conversation and, and he knew we weren't there to pin him up against the wall. And I think that's a that's an important part of it. Another question, how do you is there a secret to asking succinct questions? I tend to ramble and when I'm transcribing later, it makes me want to weep. I have been there. <laughs> I, have been there. I feel you, Michael. Not you, Michael Barbaro, Michael, who asked the question, sorry. I don't know that you have to, I don't know that there's so much virtue in every question being succinct. Sometimes, I, I know this from listening to Terry, people come to understand and, and respect their hosts because the questions reflect the way they think. And sometimes a longer question, a fumbling question, is a window into how, how an interviewer, how their mind works. I find I sometimes, repeat myself in a question and I, th th I think it's because in part I'm giving the person time to think of their answer. Yeah. You know, I can kind of sense that they're not ready yet so I'll just kind of say it in a couple of different ways waiting for them to be ready to speak and it's all very intuitive that that happens but I feel like that's kind of what I'm, what I'm doing. Sometimes I have a rambling question because I haven't fully formulated what the question is because I'm responding to something that they said and I know that there's a kernel I want to get to. I'm just not sure what it is yet. So, I'm, you know, it's, a, it's not a good habit, but I'll just kind of start talking because it's my turn and kind of wait for the, <laughs> for the thought to, to crystallize. Um, you know, in, in, in radio, like dead air is really a scary thing. So mm -hmm. you're always trying to like, fill the space, even, even though you know you can edit it. But I started in live radio when like you couldn't edit it. So <laughs> so um, there's always that fear of, of um, dead air. There's also the, you know, sometimes the shortest questions in the world are the most valuable in the moment. Why? What were you thinking? Yeah, yeah. They're almost cliches. But I, but if, if that little feeling creeps up your neck that, that you don't know why someone's saying something they're saying, or you don't know what they mean, I mean, the an almost mockably common question on the on the on the daily is, um, what does that mean? What what did that you know? What did it mean in the moment? Or, and and that's because we collectively, because we're in this Google document, or I'm having this feeling too. We we genuinely don't understand why something's happening, or we think that the story will become richer if we ask that question and get a good answer. And if and of course if the answer doesn't work out, you just cut it. I, I do that all the time too. Like I'll take a key word that somebody has said or a phrase and I'll say, like you said this, what do you mean by that? Because it's a way of getting deeper into what they just said. You know, often the way of getting deeper is just to repeat back what somebody said and basically say, take it to the next step. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Tell me more about it. I'm going to start what scanning the chats for people to say, what did you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, also very neutral. it's also a very neutral question. It, yeah. it literally contains no, it contains no judgment. It's not, well, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. What yeah. do you, it's, 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 it's straight down the middle. And I think a lot of the, the best questions, they don't land with any sense of judgment because that, of course, can really throw the person you're interviewing or make them suspicious of you. And at the same time, in some kinds of interviews, you really want to go like, wow, that's crazy. I can't believe that happened. Like, who's, who would ever say that, uh, a thing like that to you? But, you know, 
those tend to not necessarily be the newsy interviews, but yeah, more the personal, like the really personal ones. I don't know. But yeah, there's so much judgment that I don't mean passing judgment, but like judgment calls you have to make in the moment when you're figuring out what to say and how to say it, which is not news to anybody who's listening now. <laughs> but just, <laughs> just to affirm how hard it is to know what to say and how to say it. But it gets to maybe something that will illuminate that uh, several folks have asked, what was your toughest interview or what interview did you learn from the most or, or your most difficult interview? Are there particular interviews that really just shine in your minds as this is where I sort of either had to step my game up or where I really bombed or where I learned the most? Uh, Michael, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that um, that we talk a lot on our on, on the daily, the editors, the producers, uh, about an interview we did with with James Comey because it wasn't the first interview he did, it wasn't the second interview he did, or even the third or the fourth interview he did, and we had the time to really think about what we wanted to ask him when his when his book came out. And we treated it a, a, as a bit of a psychological conversation. We read his book and we thought to ourselves, you know, here's a person who has really upset the left and really upset the right. Uh, and his inquiries, when you really study them, they, they, the two big ones, the way he handled the Trump one, the way he handled the Clinton one, they contained the thread of a person who uh, stepped outside of the procedural norms on two occasions but in no discernibly partisan way. And so as we talked and as the interview got underway, this the, this, the moment that really crystallized it was that, that he refused to, to kind of give any ground on, but do you recognize why people think that you have, that you have started, that, that in both of these cases, you exercised your own judgment in a way that defied the kind of traditions of the Bureau and, and law enforcement and therefore created a lot of consequences. And he just kept shying from it. And, and finally, uh, the formulation we used was, listening to you, you sound a little bit like Donald Trump. I and I alone know how to fix it. And he just had such a look of, there's a little bit of horror on his face. Um, and he, dis he disputed that. But in that moment, our thinking and the way we had thought about the interview and, and everything he had set up into that moment um, it all kind of crystallized into, I think, a very powerful element of the interview that 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 worked because we'd asked an organic, tough question that um, that I don't think he'd ever been asked before. Had you planned that in advance? No, not exactly. But but I said to my colleague when we started working on it, I said, you know, when I read this book and when I think about it, I think about that that phrase because I had been at the Republican convention, I'd watched that speech and written a story. But I said this phrase keeps ringing around my head, I alone can fix it. Um, and so I kept, I'd had that in the back of my head and then we used it in the interview. For, for me, like one of my hard interviews was with, and this is a kind, kind of old one, but with Bill O'Reilly back, back when he was like the number one show on Fox News. And he had come out with a memoir right after Al Franken's memoir came out. And this was when Al Franken was still on radio before he was in the Senate. And um, Al Franken's book was about Fox News and the, and the far right. And there was a whole chapter on Bill O'Reilly. So we invited Bill O'Reilly on kind of at a, out of a sense of fairness. Like we talked a little bit about you. You have a new book too. You come on and talk. And he started accusing me falsely of throwing every defamation in the book at him while I was fair to Al Franken. And then he, he walked out. He was in his studio, his radio studio, because he was doing a radio show too at the time. And so he just kind of like, you know, turned off the volume and that was the end. And so I had to figure out like, how do I respond to that? So in real time, I just said, oh, so is that what you're gonna do? You're just gonna like not allow me to respond. You're just gonna walk out and end it there. And there was no response. And I said, well, I guess that's the end of this interview. Um, and my guess has been. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, you know, occasionally that happens where, 
somebody has this agenda before they even step in and they just start attacking you. And you have to think about like, am I going to take it personally? Is this about me? Or is this about some stereotype of like NPRs, like liberal media, and I'm going to like, I'm going to give it to them, you know? Um, and in this case, I thought it had nothing to do with me. It was really all about what he saw as NPR's liberal media. And every night that week, he attacked public broadcasting. And that goes back to this idea of, you know, of, of kind of what interviews are we prepared for, but what interviews are, are going to be fruitful. And, you know, you have a high wire act because all your shows are interviews. Sometimes we can, we can introduce, we, we introduce different devices. For example, we actually um, have, we have done an episode about Sean Hannity, but a colleague had gone out to Long Island to interview him and recorded it. And so there was a kind of, there was an intermediary a colleague who went and did the conversation. So we do a trick we call, you know, you interview the person who did the interview. And so that is a helpful buffer because it immediately means that you're curating a conversation rather than bringing Sean Hannity or take, take your liberal pundit you know, into the room um, for, for what may ultimately be a performance rather than a real conversation. Yeah, performance is the right word. Mm. So we're almost out of time. So very quickly, could I get the both of you to maybe just give a tip or two of something that people can take from this seminar and practice in their everyday lives to improve their listening skills in a way that will improve their interviewing skills? Well, I'll, I'll make a suggestion that it's okay to say to somebody who you're interviewing, can you say that again? Because I think I lost you. It w wasn't clear to me, forgive me but can you just say it one more time? It doesn't, it's not a bad thing to do that. It doesn't make you stupid to do that. It's probably helpful to the other person in better crystallizing the thought. And if the thought isn't crystallized, you're not gonna be able to use it, whether you're doing print or radio. You won't be able to transcribe it in a meaningful way. You won't be able to get a clear quote. So like, don't hesitate, in my opinion, don't hesitate to ask for clarification or for a redo in order to make it more clear for the benefit of the person you're interviewing, for the benefit of your audience, and for your own benefit as the interviewer. That's so well said. And I think similarly, there's no shame in, especially in an edited show, sometimes saying, you know, I, I need a minute. I, just give me one second. I need, to, I need to think about this. Sometimes I think we, cre we can create, I know I did when the show started, a kind of false stress level of, oh my God, oh my God, I don't know what this, I, and I've learned over time, I've, also, I've, got, I've learned how to grow as, a, as an interviewer, but sometimes it's okay, and Terry, I hope you agree with me. To, uh, yeah, I just need a second, I need a second. I just need, I totally need a second agree with you. I do that too, and I totally agree with you. I'll say like, oh, forgive me, I just lost my train of thought, I know it will come back. And I'll just yeah. like, wait for a minute. Yeah. It like years, but it'll be a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the other thing is to, pre you know, is to practice this preparation. Uh, it's for three years, five days a week, I have been thinking about how interviews get structured and, and kind of the flow of questions, even though once the interview starts, a lot of the time spontaneity kicks in and you have to change a lot of it. But that rep, rep we call them reps on our team on the daily, get in those reps. And the reps are write a script of questions, write a list of questions, do it next day, write questions, do it. And so it really, like anything, is all about practice. All right. Well, I'm going to practice ending things on time here. Well, <laughs> thank you both so much. Uh, out of respect for everybody's time, we will wrap up. I know there were a ton of questions that we didn't get to, so hopefully we'll be able to get some answers to folks after the fact. I do want to add out some words here about the Journalism Institute, which is here to help and support journalists in this very challenging time. Uh, the Journalism Institute has waived all the registration fees for programming since March in light of the pandemic. We're hoping that you'll give our work a thumbs up with the donation in support of learning and seminars just like this. And we hope you'll complete a survey about your experience. At the end, you're going to receive that probably via email along with the link to a recording of this program. So everybody stay well. Thank you for listening, which is the skill that we've all been working on. And thank you so much to Michael and Terry for sharing those insights. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you Kimberly. Kimberly. And uh, Michael, it's an honor to meet you. <laughs> Very uh, complete joy. And if you guys can't see the chat, you're getting a million thank yous. Good. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you for making time.